Welcome to Five Strike Weekly, everyone. Atlanta United overcame a difficult loss to Toronto with a victory over Montreal this weekend. Can they keep the good results coming with a victory against the Chicago Fire? We discuss all that and more next. Welcome to the show, Five Strike Fam. I'm AJ, this is Tanner McLeod. Before we get into it, become a member of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button on YouTube or hop over from Facebook and subscribe. Before we get into the two matches we have to review, we want to announce that there are two brand new segments that we are revealing later on in the show, so stay tuned for that. But as for now, we're kind of also on Darren Eel's watch because... Uh, Cryptic tweet alert. Yeah, God, man. It's just, uh, you know, he tweeted an hour ago. We're t filming this on a Monday uh, around 6 or 7 p.m. And it's just like, we're just waiting. Just, yeah, right as Come we're going to start filming, it's just like, oh, by the way, here's just a cryptic tweet about a lake and a wild horse or something. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate you. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we're going to try to do this and still keep an eye on that for you guys, but let's get into that Toronto FC match from Wednesday that ended in a heartbreaker uh, with a, some controversy, uh, a little bit of a just absolute, just terrible miss. There was a whole lot of everything. Uh, yeah, and- uh, Especially but, packing the last 10 minutes. Yeah, exactly. That, that you know, if you stayed up for that, that is just like, oh. At least it was entertaining, I, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's for a neutral, it's definitely entertaining, but for, yeah, for us, definitely was just, uh, yeah, not a match that you wanted to see end like that, nor uh, also kind of the refereeing, you know, the, the very indecisiveness from a guy, Alan Kelly, apparently he's gotten ref of the year He's one of the better refs times. in MLS in terms of being around long enough. Well, better is yeah. a very interesting term to use. Maddening. Um, yeah, I mean, basically to sum up MLS, MLS refs as a whole, look no further than Josie Altidore's Twitter, where I yeah. found myself agreeing with him when he said MLS refs are trash. Yeah. Agreed. Yes, so I guess so. In, in this specific instance, we'll go ahead and talk about the penalty that ended up proving to be the winning goal for Toronto sure. was not a penalty. Yeah, at absolutely. All. He, did, he just went down. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I think you know from the angle that he was at, I think also he wasn't even in the picture. So for him to even determine that is tough. And uh, you know, VAR and, helped kind of, not really. They, but they like, didn't make a call at all, essentially. And so that's what VAR is for when you determine those type of calls. And then yes, we get the benefit of at least trying to tie the match, but it shouldn't have been three two in the beginning. Either way, uh, I think you know, the, the, it happens like yeah, this. Sometimes. It happens like this. But if you want to rewind it back to the beginning, though, this match yeah. started off and ended on the same note horribly yeah. for Atlanta United. Sure. Ball in the back of the net within what 30, 30, 30 40 seconds. seconds. You know, you you, yeah. you get the ball, you lose it in transition, trying to move up the field. You you lose it in your in the little area between the middle third and the final third. Bish bash bosh, boom, Toronto are right. in, one nil, and it's just like, what the hell has happened? And it's not the first time that's happened to Atlanta United this it's season. It's true, exactly. Yeah, we, we get blindsided a lot going into a match where I think, yeah, maybe the energy and the urgency isn't enough in the very beginning. And also, I mean, it's, yeah, um, you know, you have Parkey, who's used to playing more as a center back. Obviously, he has been playing more right, more right back this season, but uh, he pretty much was tucked in because... Yeah, Toronto pretty much had a lot of guys in the box already. It was kind of, you know, swashbuckling, and I commend them for that. But, yeah, we basically, you know, conceded the wings, and, yeah, you know, the guy just comes in, free cross, you know, and then... one no. And I think yeah. the thing is, is that you could recognize very quickly, even though Atlanta United did get a penalty, you know, in the 17th minute that P.T. Martinez dispatched, he, Atlanta United wasn't playing well. I think that yeah. tactically from the get-go, Frank DeBoer got this wrong because Toronto knew that they were missing a lot of key players. Uh -huh. So what they did was they packed the bot, they packed the middle of the park, mm -hmm. and were consistently overrunning the two midfielders in Darlington Nagby and Eric Rometty. Yeah. In addition to that, because of how the teams the team was set up, you had Pitti Martinez and Michael Parkhurst on the right who between the two of them don't have the pace or the work rate at those positions to cover the ground they needed to. Yeah. And because of that, there was the spaces between the two of them mm -hmm. where Toronto was finding a lot of space to get the ball when they exactly. were, doing, were having their build up. So and yeah, an unlucky deflection off of Parkhurst where he, I think made a pretty good tackle that the ball had ended up anywhere else than it would have maybe yeah, uh, absolutely. ended up different. But uh, it was and one then of those, late, yeah. you know, and that's that's the, the difference I think a lot of times on the right. But is, that's kind of on DeBoer in a sense because mm -hmm. you have to understand yeah. Yeah. personnel and you have to think that maybe these two guys don't combine well enough together Jeez. and then when you see that 
mm-hmm. Toronto is packing the midfield. I, I was surprised at how long it took, and I was on. I was very vocal about it on he, Twitter. He fixed it later on. He fixed it later yeah. on, but I was surprised at how long it took him to recognize the issues mm-hmm. that were there because Toronto created a lot of chances this game. Atlanta right. did lose 3-2, and they did lose on a penalty, but it could have been five for Toronto. They had their chances, and then they didn't, they didn't take them at times, but they were creating loads of opportunities because Atlanta United couldn't find enough guys to mark the men that were running into the yeah. box. And yeah, and to be fair to them, they were also yeah short-handed, and so for them to be able to find this urgency, uh, and then yeah, we're a little short-handed, uh, definitely an attack for sure. But at least the uh, you know the back line is the same back line. You know, uh, you know, Remetti and Nagby. Yeah, they've played together in the midfield a lot. Um, I yeah. think Toronto had a really interesting tactical decision, though, by playing Pozuelo up top as almost a false yes. nine. It Every time he dropped in deep, it, it would pull a center back. And whenever it pulled a center back, usually it was Miles Robinson. Mm-hmm. It was forcing uh, Michael Parkhurst to tuck inside to kind of create mm-hmm. a back line. And whenever that happened, because P.T. Martinez is an attacking player and is relied to, it was you know mostly relied to do that, mm-hmm. that created loads of space in those on areas wings. on exactly. the wings, mm-hmm. so that whenever Atlanta United did try to contain them in the middle, Toronto mm-hmm. found that space. And I really was surprised at how long it took him to change. He didn't eventually change and switch to that midfield three. Right. Brought Julian Gressel in because that that third man in the midfield can allow a team to cover more of those lateral spaces. Right. But I was surprised it took him so long to bring on a Jeff Lorenowitz in the second half. I would have expected mm-hmm. him to come on earlier to keep that switch because he's a guy that could have neutralized and the threat. It was definitely better, I think, in the second half. But I think it's maybe a, a case of where they try to ride the wave of uh, attack and then, you know, in the second half, then you bring on a guy. Because if you bring on a Jeff Lerner so early, you know, uh, without maybe trying to solve the problems on the field themselves, then you bring on a defender essentially you know, in the first half, which is, isn't Well, I wouldn't have had him brought on in the first right. half, but I would have had him brought on earlier in the second half than yeah. when he was brought sure. on. I think sure. that, that would have been a decision that yeah. makes sense to get more control of the match because I didn't think that Atlanta United necessarily controlled any part of this match. Yes, they did end up going up 2-1 mm-hmm. off of a very skillful move from Brandon Vasquez. He didn't get the assist, but mm-hmm. the turn, the cross, getting everything into the box, and then mm-hmm. Julian Russell cleaning everything up. But then immediately Atlanta United turns around and ships another goal. So yeah. the best work that Atlanta United did, I felt, was on the break Mm -hmm. and if you're going to be playing that way then at least be able to control a team when they're attacking you Mm -hmm. which would have made sense to bring Lorenowitz on earlier Mm -hmm. so I I was a bit confused about how DeBoer approached this match tactically it wasn't Atlanta United's best I think they showed a little bit of MLS rust because they hadn't been playing at an MLS level because Mm -hmm. of the the break and Mm -hmm. US Open Cup and even Columbus yes but it's it's still US Open Cup Mm -hmm. there's still a bit of rotation I think that you really see again how important Franco Escobar is to this team. Absolutely. When he's there, he has the work rate and the ability to get back and forth and cover for a PT Martinez, even when he's up the field. And then he knows that Miles Robinson can, can cover in behind him as well. So I think you really missed him in this match. On the whole though, I didn't think this was, it wasn't It wasn't vintage Atlanta United. It was Double more wide foot. open, mm-hmm. but I, I definitely think that it's something that is more of an anomaly than necessarily how we play consistently. Yeah, because yeah, there. This kind of probably reminded us more of early season uh, Atlanta United, where yeah, we were shipping goals, we were struggling to maybe create something from actual play. But in terms of on a whole, it was very reminiscent of just the mistakes of early uh, this year and the wastefulness in front of goal. Because although yeah. he did contribute to that to that second goal, Vasquez mm-hmm. had numerous opportunities Absolutely that kept falling well. to him, and he he just couldn't find find the footing to put it away. He had a, a, a at least two opportunities in my opinion that I thought he really could have done better with and possibly mm-hmm. scored on. Mm-hmm. PT Martinez created a few chances as well and I think this was one of his better games which mm-hmm. is frustrating when we get onto the Montreal match. Yep. Um, and, and then obviously everything culminates with that penalty in the 90 whatever it was minute yeah. when he the ball comes into the box you think the game is over then ref goes to VAR there's a handball PT steps up and puts it absolutely nowhere near the goal into row triple Z. Yeah and you know to be fair I think uh, you know it is difficult to take a second penalty in a game unless you're Jose Martinez, which is just like you know it doesn't matter. You know, like he will just put it in no matter what, pretty much. Uh, PT Martinez, who's been somewhat of a head case this season, um, you know he's kind of the, the de facto guy. I mean, I think if an Ezekiel Barco or Jose Martinez were in this match, they'd be definitely taking both of those penalties uh, before PT Martinez. Uh, even though, yeah, you know, he's proven, at least at River Plate, yes, he's, you know... Uh, he's played in... Mu- he's for got, me, yeah, it's he's hard for me to allow... Bigger. 
It's hard for me to let this yes. slide to the degree of the miss was so if, if you put it on frame and it gets saved, that happens. Sure. But he's played in matches that have far more pressure than sure. this. He's faced far more pressure than this. He is a player of a but quality. He, he's been underperforming. And he that's has been underperforming. But at the same time, he's a player that has expectations because he's shown what he can oh, do. Oh, sure. I expect a player of his caliber to put it on frame, yeah. or at least close. Yeah. And he didn't put it close at oh, all. Uh, of course not. But you know, the, the first one was well taken. I think it's when the keeper already has a read on you, you know, because he's seen how you've, uh, you know, taken your penalty. I think that's the difference. Is that he he dove the right way too. I think he was in his head, and you know, maybe so. But again, if if, if PT Martinez is allowing stuff like that to get into oh, his no, head, then he's course. far weaker mentally than I ever thought. I mean, he he is a player that he's played against. Boca in the Copa oh, sure. Libertadores. Exactly. He knows what pressure feels well, that, like. You know, there was no pressure form. in the. Doesn't matter. There's no pressure yeah. in that moment comparatively. There is nothing he mm -hmm. will feel in MLS that will come anywhere close to the pressure he felt playing in those matches. Mm -hmm. And again, if it's saved, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. If he mentally cannot step up and put a penalty on target, what are you doing? What? How are you the South American Player of the Year? I mean, you, you had a good game up to then. How could he not have been confident? He'd mm -hmm. already scored, so you should feel good you already scored. He'd been contributing. He'd had attacking chances. He'd been creating chances for his teammates. Mm -hmm. If anything, that should have been the most confident he should have felt all season taking a penalty going, I've already scored once. I'm going to step up. I'm going to do it again. And he completely fluffed his lines. I mean, okay. He absolutely, yes, fluffed his lines. But uh, in terms of, you know, PT Martinez, on that second one, he had to wait a long time. I mean, he you, did, yes. I VAR, absolutely ran him that. You know, when you, you're you just waiting there and you're, you're, you're cold, essentially. I mean, it, it's not excusable, but there are reasons, I think, why, uh, you know, he would sky that chance after so many of those factors. If, if it was just like a regular, you know, if he skied the first one, okay, absolutely. Like, we need to get on his back hard because that's a whole different story. But, but I think then again, there isn't he brought definite. in to, to be clutch in these moments? This is why you sign a player of his caliber because you know he's dealt with moments yeah. of this pressure before. And he, if you just can't count on him- He just hasn't shown it this season in terms of being, you know, being the guy. And so, you know, I'm, I'm willing to give him a pass uh, somewhat on this. It doesn't mean that I think, you know, oh, you know, the rest of the season, if he, uh, you know, is playing like this, it's. You know, no big deal, but absolutely, I think there are factors at play. And so anyway, I think we'll move on from this. Uh, because, well, I'm gonna complain about him more in a second. Yeah, exactly, because so. <laughs> there, there are other other moments that we can talk about this as well. But um, yeah, I think it's definitely, um, you know, it's more wastefulness from the team in terms of in front of goal. Um, you know, it's been the, the case this whole season, essentially, uh, even Jose Martinez when he's been in the squad. But um, yeah, I think, you know, in terms of, uh, the craziness, it not only was in the match, it was definitely before the match as well with Andrew Carlton, uh, with, yeah, him leaving his passport uh, and, you know, just before the match, uh, you know, not even be able to make the trip. And so we had a short bench. Um, it's, yeah, of course, that's also very maddening as well. Um, <sighs> Stupid. Pretty much, uh, yeah, it's inexcusable. I think, with, you know, couple of that with the, uh, other indiscretions that he's had in the past. Yeah, I mean, it's not a good look. And I think, yeah, Frank de Boer, uh, yeah, probably even if he was going to go back home and go get the, the passport and, you know, take a, a red eye or whatever to fly there, I think he probably was told, yeah, you know, don't come on. Don't, don't, don't come to this match. I mean, it's, I mean, at some point in time as a coach, you have to give, you have to be hard. Yeah, I mean, Tata yeah. Martino did it after the MLS Cup. Yeah. You know, this is, if you're not learning a lesson, you're not gonna learn with a carrot. I mean, right. you, clearly you have to go with the stick. And yeah, and I think if you see a, a case like an Ezekiel Barco, who had a, an indiscretion last season as well, and, you know, uh, has definitely turned that 180 degrees around, I think, yeah, you can see that, okay, if Andrew Carlton can do this, he can turn it around. Of course, he's not the talent of an Ezekiel Barco, but I think, yes, he definitely has talent, and he just has to show the professionalism to be able to do it. And, I mean, um, you know, we'll get into what the repercussions were in the news later, but, um, yeah, on to uh, the post-match quotes from this match. Frank de Boer talked about if the team was looking rusty because they were only playing their fourth match of the month, 
He said, quote, no, I don't think so. Everybody is fit enough. Of course, we are missing important players, but so are they, so that is no excuse. The game could have went either way. We could have three points. They could have three points. Maybe at the end, a draw would be good for both sides. I, I like that he's not you know, using any of that as an excuse. It's definitely a lot different from earlier in the season in terms of any of the, uh, the speak that he was uh, giving out. And so at least with this, um, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's accurate to a degree where, yeah, I mean, they were short, we were short. I think at the end of the day, we just weren't good enough finishing our chances. And yeah, I mean, you know, I think on a, on a better, more luckier day, uh, yeah, we maybe could have gone away with uh, three points. So, you know, is what it is with this. It's football. It ha happens sometimes. Exactly. But uh, so let's move on from this match and get to the Montreal Impact match at the Benz, where, yes, uh, you know, it also was not a fantastic performance, but it, I think still, um, you know, we were buoyed by just a, just, uh, I would say, you know, just an incredible performance from Justin Miram out of nowhere. Absolutely. I think Justin Miram made whatever it was Atlanta United gave away, which was not a lot. Yeah. After the game, two, we gave away a bag of Skittles and two Oreos yeah, because it felt like it was game. nothing. And he puts in a performance like that. His first goal was absolutely out of this world. It looked, I mean, uh, I was talking to Jeff Lerner today in the team store, and he was like, the only people who've scored that is like Tito against Orlando and then yeah. putting up against Montreal and then San Jose last season as well. Mm -hmm has been the person that cuts inside from the left and unleashes that shot. It's like, holy hell, that just went to the far corner. Right. It was madness, and it, it was a great goal, and it needed something like that, because Atlanta right. United, creatively in the final third, weren't playing that well. I think there yep. were some really solid individual performances throughout this match. Justin Miram, Darlington Nagby, mm -hmm. uh, My uh, Miles Robinson, LGP, LGP, LGP. Was. Yeah. Pogba played yeah. well at left back, but in terms of that final creative spark and getting the ball into the box, it just wasn't there. So you needed a bit of moment of magic, and Atlanta right. United got that from that first goal. Yeah, and Montreal Impact, they came to bunker, they came to smash and grab, uh, and they almost kind of uh, got away with it. Uh, but it really definitely was, uh, I think, you know, you need that moment of madness, like you were saying, uh, someone shooting from distance because, uh, and someone that has the quality and that type of shot. Um, but yeah, I think throughout still most of it, you know, we're struggling to break this down. And this is what happens again to the best clubs in the world. But uh, yeah, and Montreal Impact are in the place that they are in the standings because they know how to, uh, you know, not only bunker, but you know, on the road, yeah, this is what they do, you know, and this is what they've come to do at the Benz multiple times, uh, and they were almost effective. But um, you know, I think also, uh, you know, with a little bit of a, a scramble uh, in front of goal near the end of yeah, the match, it's you get a wonder goal, out. you get a wonder goal, and then you get a set piece, yeah. and then you win two one. You get three points in a mm -hmm. match where you showed your depth. You showed against yeah. one of the teams, maybe not the best teams, but against a team that mm -hmm. is currently, even though you have three games in hand on them, right. is above you in the Eastern stand and yep. in standings. They've been playing decent. They had beaten Portland in, mm -hmm. in the midweek. So to their speak team on that is good. Depth. Yeah. yeah, and to speak, and so you have it, that depth and they stepped up. Yeah, exactly. And it's amazing, not even uh, with a guy that started, uh, Breck Shea gets involved immediately, uh, often much maligned Breck Shea. Uh, yeah, he gets the assist. When you know you would have thought you know a guy that hasn't uh, been the most supported uh, player, he would have maybe tried to get a goal there, but he is selfless enough to just square it. And uh, at first, I thought it was going in because I couldn't tell from the angle sure, I was at. Sure, the sure. Justin Miram's right there and, and smashes it into the back of the net. And I love when a player completely just destroys the ball from like one yard out and yeah, just exactly. leaves it with no doubt. <laughs> And then he wills away in celebration, and you can see how much he's already taken the to the relief. city, and the relief, and yeah. the, the love he feels from the fans, which I definitely right. feel for him after that. And, uh -huh. and what I, a difference it is it, with yeah. the type of celebration. Between but, us and yeah. that club from Florida that yeah. he really hated his time with. Yeah, this versus... Yeah, he he, he yeah. heard and he felt the love, and I think that was incredible. And I think he earned a place in a lot of Atlanta fans' hearts with that yeah. performance, because he, he left it all out on the field. Yeah. and. 
I think for me, the best way you can look at this match is, is you got three points when you absolutely needed to get three points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't the best performance, but it was the first time you've won a match in MLS this season while conceding a goal. Yeah, so and you, especially, yeah, with uh, Jose Martinez out, with Ezekiel Barco out, with Tito Vijalba out. It's, uh, and then yeah. with PT Martinez being inconsistent again. He yeah, had sure. one of his better games, minus the penalty miss on Wednesday, and then he in this one, he wasn't that great, and Frank DeBoer spoke about that after mm -hmm. the game. Well, the, the first half, up. yeah, the first half was not the worst for him. Right. It was, he was still uh, creating some chances for Atlanta, but the second half, yeah. He it, fell off a cliff very Yeah, quickly. exactly. It was, I think, you know, I, he's a guy that maybe just, you can't play two times in a week at this form, because yeah. it's one of those things where it's, like uh, Frank DeBoer was saying, it's a little bit detrimental to the team. It's a danger because, yeah, he's just giving it away easily. He's uh, airing passes or not running all the way for a through ball that's pretty much all his if he wants it. And uh, so that's, you know, I think it uh, it makes sense that he was taken off. Absolutely. Um, it was deserved that he probably should have been taken off because I think you could hear the groans from the, the stadium as well. And then Dion Pereira comes on and immediately makes a contribution. Yeah. It's a shot on target, cuts it on his left foot, keeper makes a save. Mm -hmm. He came on and he was hungry. And that's one of those things that I just, I'm not seeing it from PT. I don't see that hunger. I don't see it in the body language where mm -hmm. it looks like he, he wants it. He just looks, he cuts yeah. a very frustrated and sometimes disinterested figure on, sure. on the pitch. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why for a lot of Atlanta United fans, they're really starting to feel that same yeah. energy towards him because it's mm -hmm. it's just not there. And yes, well, he's I, not I, a Miguel Almiron. He's not going to yeah. run around everything. He's a different type of player. But I think that I think that that is the issue, though. People have these uh, just heightened expectations, which yes, are warranted because he has the title. Yes, but the difference is that you know they're expecting him to uh, you know run after every single ball. Which sure, I mean on uh, you know on attack, yes. But you know, running back and tracking back, I think that's something that is maybe too much to expect. I, from I get him. that, but if, if but, you expect that, then I also expect him mm -hmm. to put forward at least the numbers in attacking. And he has what yeah. two goals and two assists, and we're 19 games into the season. Oh, for sure, he's under. Last season, he was South no American doubt. Player of the Year. That's not this year, but mm -hmm. he did it at River, and he was had expectations to move to right. Europe with big clubs linked to him. Mm -hmm. He has the background, he mm -hmm. has the ability. I think it's fair for fans to have expectations of him to oh, at sure. least perform somewhere close to it. I'm not expecting him to come out and mm -hmm. put up Carlos Vela numbers. I think he's almost, if not as good as, as talented as him, mm -hmm. technically, but I'm not expecting him to just walk out and start scoring it's goals left, right, and center. It's definitely but it, effort. But at least have a level of consistency. Mm -hmm. There's no consistency at all. He and can have a good difference. game and a bad game. You have no idea what you'll get from him. Mm -hmm. That That is the difference, is that consistency, consist, consistency in effort uh, because I think, yeah, there is maybe a little bit of that where he is pressing. He is trying to, uh, you know, be the hero, trying to live up to those expectations, which, I mean, a lot of players in the world have these expectations thrown on them because of a, a large transfer fee, a record transfer fee. I mean, he's not the first player to have underperformed in that respect. It doesn't excuse, again, the underperforming. Um, you know, your, your man's... Paul Pogba is a example. Absolutely, no, no, he's the he's first one that comes you know? to mind, but here's the thing about so, Paul Pogba. For all the criticism that Paul yes. Pogba faces, if you look at his statistics he, for he Manchester United, he's first in every single category mm -hmm. for Manchester United. Mm -hmm. So as much as he comes under criticism because the team doesn't perform well, mm -hmm. he's still putting in the numbers. Mm -hmm. PT isn't even putting in the numbers. I understand the pressure that comes with the transfer fee, and I understand yeah. the pressure that comes with everything that he had associated with him. Mm -hmm. But... I'm not going to give him the same cut, like the same you know break that I gave Ezekiel Barco, because Ezekiel Barco came to, came here as an 18 year old. PD Martinez is sure. 25 years old. Yeah, he, he, he should, should be, be able prime. to step in and be able to perform at a level that mm -hmm. fans expect. And if he's not, then at least present the effort or present the the attitude that you're mm -hmm. trying. Yeah. it just seems that, that, that is... every time it's just oh. sure. No, it, it is. That's the the I think the root of the frustration for a lot of the the fans is. Uh, you know, okay, he barely gets some contact and he goes down. He's used to different calls in, uh, you know, South America. That's different. Yeah, Frank DeBoer has even said, yes, he needs to probably learn that he needs to probably stay on his feet a little bit more. The calls are different here. Uh, there's a lot of that where it's just, yeah, you know, the if you just read, uh, you know, body language, I mean, it's not exactly the the best indicator, but you know, you you have someone like uh, a Mesut Ozil at Arsenal, who you know, it's just these 
uh, these tens in the world, they get a lot of flack like this. If they're, you know, because yeah, they don't really maybe contribute on the defensive end as, you know, the naked eye can see, but I think, you know, chance creation and whatnot, uh, they're usually up there, if not near the top, if not the best in the league, uh, say a Mesut Ozil or like a James Rodriguez or, you know, a player like that. So, a PT Martinez. Yeah, exactly. And so for him, you know, I think it's just a matter of, you know, yes, he's not that type of player. He needs to feel comfortable. And that's clearly, he still isn't. Uh, he maybe has, you know, in terms of speculation, maybe uh, isn't comfortable in uh, Frank DeBoer's system as well. He's been played across yeah, I'm not going to blame DeBoer for that because DeBoer's given him every single position yeah, to succeed. Exactly. He's played him on the left as a 10 yeah. and now on the right. So he's given him every yeah. potential position that he can play in mm -hmm. and he's given him the ability to not have to worry as much mm -hmm. about defending. You would think to try that, to find that mm -hmm. freedom within the system to where play your game, figure right. out a way to, to meld with it and it just hasn't happened. And, yeah. and, and I think the most frustrating thing for me and I think for everyone is the fact that we know he can do it. We've seen him do yeah. it. We know there is a talent there. And I think that's what really drives the, the frustration is it wasn't like he was a one season wonder or that, that you overpaid for. It's a player who has a lot of ability and we've seen the ability and we were excited about the ability. And it's just, we want to see that from him because if he can start ticking, it makes the rest of the team well, better. And yeah, I, I tell you this though. I mean, it's, uh, you know, what's going to make him perform better isn't, any boos or you know the just frustration that you know uh, fans are pouring onto his social media or any part of Atlanta United social media, that's definitely not going to help. No, it's not going to help. But at the same time, you know, I, I get it. I get it, and I you know, but I think you know it's still a, a period of time where you know if we support him, it'll be still I think you know not the Ezekiel Barco situation of last year where uh, a guy that. You know, it's a personal thing off the field, and he gets a ton of flack, and he comes good because through his sheer will. Uh, I don't know if PT Martinez is as mentally strong, but, you know, I think that's just something that will, you know, is remained to be seen. But either way, anyway, let's get back to this match. And uh, so uh, let's talk about essentially how, you know, Montreal, where they really still made it really, really difficult for us. Uh, and for that, uh, I think we were still probably a little lucky to get this win, uh, even though it is a win for us. I think I, I, because we we get that chance at the end, but before that, it still was you know I, I think an unlucky bounce towards us. Uh, they get a counter because you know they were they had a couple chances. They had a couple chances. They you know any ball over the top uh, and they might have been in. I mean they, they got their goal through you know a. Uh, a corner and a bounce ball, unlucky, you know, it's just, it, but Atlanta United has had, it's kind of where football balances itself out though, because sure. Atlanta United have had results go against them, like mm -hmm. say the Real Salt Lake match early this season or the Toronto sure. match where you have matches that just don't go your way and you have mm -hmm. those moments. They even themselves out. And, and mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of what happened for Atlanta United here. Mm -hmm. I think Atlanta were the better team. They showed more ambition despite the fact that they didn't play sure. particularly well. Um, I mean, and, and this is the last I'll say on it, you know, this is the type of match where you sign a player like PT Martinez because mm -hmm. you expect him to be able to be the key that can unlock a defense. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to a degree, he, he did get the assist on the Miriam goal. Um, but he, he made the run. He made the run to and, pull the thing. Yeah, but, exactly. you know, again, it, it wasn't the rest of the team as a whole. Yeah. Going forward wasn't great. And that's yeah. kind of one of the things you've seen. But I think for me to kind of wrap it up on it is you didn't play well, but you got three points. You need to get three points on to the next one. You mm -hmm. got to win at home, and you've got the monkey off your back of getting a win in a match you conceded a goal. So you know you can do that. Yeah, as well. no, exactly. That's that's uh, I think still you know you got to get those like mental roadblocks uh, off because yeah, if you go down or you, you you know concede, yeah, you still need to have the wherewithal to see out the match and uh, you know get over the line. But um, yeah, also I think a funny anecdote from uh, this match, especially afterwards, was that. Jeff Lorenowitz, which you had spoken to uh, at the uh, the uh, the merch store at the team store, uh, was that uh, yeah you know Jeff Lorenowitz wanted to take credit for Justin Miriam's goal because he said hey in this match you got to cut in and uh, you know essentially I will uh, you know take some of your goal bonus if uh, if you do and he did and I think 
you know, maybe you had the, the, the chance to ask him. Yeah, I, jo I joked with but. him. I asked him if, if Miriam had given him half of the goal bonus like he said he would. He said he didn't get it this time, but next time if he scores, he'll get it. So yeah. we'll see if that happens. But hey, I mean, Jeff Lerner must keep telling him what to do. Maybe he keeps banging him in. Yeah, hopefully. Because, yeah, I mean, I think we all love seeing those just absolute rockets uh, cutting in. It's just, uh, yeah. My coworker asked if he was a season ticket holder. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yes. That was a whole moment. Oh. Woo! Anyway, yeah. so, uh, but... Um, let's get into the news then. Uh, this has been a kind of uh, crazy, uh, you know, episode so far. So we apologize for the uh, the up and downness. But I guess honestly, we should start with the big news, which we touched on earlier, is the yeah. fact that Atlanta ended up signed a player. Exactly. And so, uh, fantastic news is that Emerson Hindman is officially an A5 stripe. Uh, it was yeah during the the time that we have recorded this episode. So. Uh, finally, at least, we don't have to at least keep an eye on it while we're still recording this. But, uh, you know, Emerson, Emerson Hyndman, uh, he comes on loan from Bournemouth. Uh, and, yeah, it's a trade for his discovery rights with FC Dallas. Uh, it is... Kind of hefty. Kind of hefty, and which means... Uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But, uh, it's a an international slot in 2019 and 2020. It's $200,000 in GAM. Uh, for his discovery rights, which FC Dallas held. And so, you know, they definitely didn't give us a, a, a sweet deal or anything like They're that. They're probably mad about Dylan Castaneda. Yeah, pro possibly. That's, yeah, thing. that could a whole, whole, be a whole uh, factor into that. But either way, uh, yeah, you know, so Heinemann comes on loan with an, uh, an option to buy uh, at the end of the 2019 season. So that's, uh, I think that kind of, I think all signs point to that we're probably going to if he performs to any degree that we like. I think it'd be wild to give up two international slots if you're not yeah. going to sign him, so. Yeah. It's a, it's quite a bit. And so, you know, also though, I mean, you know, LA United, they've been opening up uh, international slots, they've been opening up senior roster slots, uh, kind of in preparation for moves like this. And so that's at least a, a good thing there that, uh, you know, it doesn't affect us uh, that we have to, you know, lose a player that we maybe didn't want to Absolutely. or anything like that. So we've been gearing up for that. That's fantastic. In terms of the type of player he is, yes. though, he is a technical midfielder. He's kind of, he's not going to do exactly what Darlington Nagby does in terms of running around like a crazy man because right. Nagby's just a crazy man. Mm -hmm. But he is good on the ball. He's the type of player you would expect to fit well within a Frank DeBoer type system where you're controlling the play. You need a creative player on the ball who has every pass in his locker, mm -hmm. can dictate the tempo, can play one-twos and is just very comfortable on the ball. And that's the type of player he is, and it fit, fills a need for Atlanta United, Absolutely. which was depth in that midfield. Yeah, a, uh, a Kevin Kratz role, essentially, if you will, because, yeah, we, you know, especially with his injury and his restart of his rehab, essentially you have uh, a big hole where, you know, if you don't have Nagby on the pitch, you pretty much don't have a lot of creativity from the midfield. Uh, now, Rometty is solid uh, defensively and can, uh, you know, contribute a little bit here and there in attack. But, you know, this is a guy that he's not quite a number 10. He's not quite a number eight. He's kind of somewhere in between. I see he's kind of like a, he's like a blend of a six and an eight and a 10 all at the same time. He yeah. doesn't have the defensive qualities of, of a holding midfielder, like a, like a six, but he has the ability to dictate the play from deeper. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the assist numbers or that breaking into the final third that you'd get from a 10. And he doesn't necessarily have the box-to-box -box work of, of an eight, but he does give you the ability on the ball when you are holding possession and you need someone to be able to contribute in the build-up play to pass back and forth, to dictate that tempo, to recycle the ball. He's the type of player that can give you that. And right. he made 25 appearances for Fulham in the championship. He only made, I believe, five appearances for Bournemouth in the Premier League. And then he spent some time on loan at Hibernian and Rangers in the Scottish Premiership. So he's played in physical leagues as well. The mm -hmm. championship is one of the most physical leagues yeah. in world football. So in terms of physicality, he will be used to whatever he'll find in MLS. Right. And he's also a U.S. men's uh, national team guy. So in terms he's of He's played at every level. He's played at every level, uh, but he hasn't been included recently. Uh, but he did make an appearance in 2014 and 2016. So, uh, you know, he's not part of that setup. So I, at least for those fans that uh, don't love uh, the national team setup and all that type of stuff, he's not going to be taken away from us during that time. So at least there's that. But, uh, you know, so in terms of that, uh, you know, I think we were all stumped mostly from Darren Eels' cryptic tweet. Um, Typical. The, yeah, Typical. exactly. The crazy he loves, it, he loves a good cryptic tweet. But, uh, you know, I think uh, 
Shout out to Luke Allen Say for his uh, his little nugget that might have been uh, it, where uh, you know a Liverpool player was nicknamed Crazy Horse. The uh, actual photo that was posted from Darren Eels is maybe Bournemouth, maybe somewhere in Georgia. I think it's Bournemouth. I it think could it's be Bournemouth. Bournemouth, and it, it makes more sense if it is. But uh, someone was saying like Alatuna, Which whatever, might whatever. Be crazy horse, Native American, or something yeah. for one of the languages. Either way, this in one Emerson, Georgia. I don't know. This one is probably the hardest one uh, because it, I think it, it harkened back to uh, also the Nagby one with the emojis. It's just. Yeah, this one, uh, good luck with this one. It's just uh, like every time that he posts a tweet like that, it immediately becomes like, you know, like the crazy conspiracy theorist where you have like strings exactly. going all over like yep. a wall or something trying to decipher it's the, what the, the Charlie hell it is. from uh, It's Always Sunny. Yes, yes absolutely. Sure. That one. And moving on from that, Justin Miram, his strike is up for MLS Goal of the Week, and of course it is, but it's also up against Wayne Rooney's. Just wonder. Wayne Rooney isn't even gonna win. At last check, I think he had like eight percent of the vote because uh, yeah. Conquo or something like that for yeah. for Montreal had a great goal midweek. There were a lot of goals winning. that were fantastic this week. Rooney scored from like seventy yards yeah. away. Yeah, I love Miram's <laughs> goal, but Rooney scored from inside his own half against that team from Florida. Come on, now. I mean, like I'm I know, being it's completely one of those things. Yeah, for the unbiased, you you vote for Wayne Rooney's goal, of course. But you know, I think we have a reputation to uphold. And so, <laughs> so it's just one of those things. I don't know, man. It, you vote however you want. I voted for Rooney. I'm not gonna yeah. lie. But you know, I think uh, it is what it is. It's probably Mir's probably gonna win. Um, but he's also up for MLS Player of the Week, which uh, he probably is gonna win, probably by a landslide in this one. Uh, and also, uh, he's made MLS Team of the Week. So. Good week for Justin Miram. Good week for Justin Miram. He definitely was the match winner for uh, us on Saturday. But um, also, yeah, uh, in terms of uh, Frank de Boer and in terms of speaking about some of the players that have been injured, uh, Ezekiel Barco won't be rushed back. And so Smart. he probably won't be ready for Wednesday. Uh, Vishalba also is not ready yet. Uh, he's a little bit behind on what the team expected. Originally, they were hoping he'd be ready to be introduced for a little bit of play in the U.S. Open Cup match against uh, Saint, uh, FC St. Louis or St. Louis FC. I get it confused. St. Louis FC, yeah. There we go. Um, but apparently he is, like you said, behind on that, so he will not feature then. So fortunately, he is taking a little bit longer, but hopefully both of them can get back to full fitness. Obviously, for me, I'd, I'd much rather have Ezekiel Barco fit because of the way that he's been playing, and of course. I just yeah. I want him to get back. If he doesn't play this week, which he's not going to play, I'd like to see yeah. him be able to feature against New York because, well, it's the Red Bulls. And right. Yeah. Indeed. And uh, also, Joseph Martinez has returned from international duty after Venezuela was knocked out. And Shame. So, yeah. And, uh, well, he, this guy just doesn't like He's, national He scored. Setups, he scored. I don't care. He did everything yep. I wanted him to, sure. and now he can come back. He represented his team. <laughs> Happy days. You did good, Joseph. I'm proud of you. Now get back to Atlanta. Where he also didn't get to, get to play a lot, so, you know, maybe he comes back way hungrier because he's been pretty much on vacation for, uh, and while playing, you know, a few minutes here and there this past month, essentially. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so he is also available to play on Wednesday against the Chicago Fire. So, anyway, let's get into a new segment we're going to call Buy or Sell. I feel like I'm on around the horn. I like it. Yeah, right. So, in terms of, uh, you know, this first topic, it is Frank DeBoer and Andrew Carlton. They're, they had a moment. They had a uh, moment of truth uh, chat, and essentially... Frank DeBoer, he pretty much told him, I mean, yeah, like, you gotta shape up. Um, that's also uh, Steven Glass of uh, Atlanta United 2, like, okay, you know, we're gonna demote you for this match 2-2, uh, uh, and uh, you basically get to warm up and that you're not gonna be included, okay? Uh, so, do you buy or sell that uh, this is going to be enough for Carlton to shape up. Essentially, he has been training with the first squad, or the first team squad uh, this week already. Um, and so, you know, is this going to be the, uh, the, the line where, you know, he can actually break through and become the player that he's going to be? That's honestly really tough for me because mm -hmm. I, I wanna buy it because I wanna see Andrew Carlton come good. Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I'm gonna sell because I haven't seen enough from him in terms of professionalism mm -hmm. to 
that lets me know that he's going to be able to get things together. Yeah. For me personally, I feel like the MLS Cup and you know, it's your hometown team that you've been with, you were the first homegrown and you're not even included in any of the celebrations for the, for the, for the first major championship in 25 years in the city. Mm -hmm. You missed out on the championship celebration. You didn't get to ride the bus. You didn't get to do anything. Mm -hmm. that, that for me seems like if you're gonna be excluded from something, that's far, far bigger than forgetting your passport. But then to, to make another mistake like that, Mm -hmm. It's it, it for me. It just doesn't seem like his head is necessarily where it needs to be for Atlanta United. Again, I, I really hope the best for him, and I hope that he comes out. But maybe mm -hmm. he needs to be sent on loan. Maybe mm -hmm. he needs to get out of Atlanta. Maybe he needs to get his head somewhere else where he can get his work in and not face the distractions that he may face here. Mm -hmm. But for me, I, I'm I'm gonna sell because I, I just don't. I a zebra doesn't change their stripes, and so far this is kind of the player that he's shown to be so far. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, for me, I think. I think I, I buy that he can uh, learn from this. I, I hope, anyway, this is maybe hope, hopeful and wishful thinking that, uh, you know, a guy from uh, Georgia, anyway, because he's from Powder Springs, uh, can break through. And because he's got this talent, you know, you hope for the best for him and you hope that this uh, can be the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of, you know, hey, you know, like I need to, I need to shape up. I need to really make sure that I am doing the right thing. And maybe it is where he goes on loan because that is where, you know, he uh, can get away from, you know, some of the, not only the guys that, uh, you know, are kind of his boys just hanging out, not only on the team, but in the city. I mean, there, yeah, you know, he's also getting into, uh, I'm, you know, we've seen all the, the social media where he's at clubs and, and stuff like that. And he's only, yeah. Like I mean, I, th I think it's like maybe it, one of those things where that, that familiarity might allow you to become mm -hmm. complacent. complacent. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that he's a talented player and mm -hmm. you, I, I think that he wants to succeed and mm -hmm. maybe just right now things aren't clicking for him. But mm -hmm. I think, I think for me, the better question in terms of buy or sell is, mm -hmm. Is this his last chance with Atlanta United, or at least with Frank DeBoer? Yeah, no, that, that is the larger question, and I don't know if we can a really answer that. Uh, because I, if that's the if yeah. that's the question, I'm buying that because Frank uh -huh. DeBoer, he's Dutch, he's rigid, he wants you to follow a system. He sure. has he's shown that he can make some flexibility. Mm -hmm. but I don't think he's a man that you disappoint multiple times and get mm -hmm. away with it. It just he yeah, just does sure. not seem like the player, the type of coach mm -hmm. to allow that. So for me. If Andrew Carlton does stay and this is his his last his his there's another chance, I think that mm -hmm. it's probably his last chance as far as Frank DeBoer is concerned before Frank DeBoer is just gonna say, I'm not gonna mess with it because if you can't get it right and show professionalism mm -hmm. under me, then how can I trust you to play? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one of the harsh side effects and one of the harsh, you know, parts of of, of professional football. Yeah. If you can't show that like mm -hmm. your teammates do, like your manager and your coach expects of you, yeah. then you might find yourself somewhere else. Yeah, I think, you know, someone who's, I think, a good example recently is uh, Brandon Vasquez, mm -hmm. who, uh, yeah, I mean, around the same age, a year older than, uh, you know, essentially, pretty much, and, um, you know, he is putting in work, uh, clearly, you know, uh, not only in the gym afterwards, but on the pitch, uh, in practice, and so, you know, and also you see it on the, 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 the pitch uh, during games as well, where he works super hard. He's a guy who's pressing almost the entire time he's in a match. Um, that, that's a, a shining example of Ezekiel that, Barco as well, like we yeah, spoke yeah, on exactly. earlier. Ezekiel yeah. Barco was excluded from the team for, uh -huh. for indiscretions uh -huh. off the field and a lack of professionalism, and he uh -huh. got his head down and he's worked hard and look at the player he's become. Yeah. So if he can get his head down, he's a talented player, and uh -huh. I think we all wish nothing but the best for him, and we'd love to see him succeed out of yeah. the United. Anyway, so let's move on to the next buy or sell, and that is, uh, so Romario Williams has been traded to the Columbus crew. It was pretty much, uh, I mean, it's like a one for one swap pretty much uh, with Justin Miriam just a month later, but it's $100,000 in GAM and also a draft pick. Um, so, I mean, Romario Williams, you know, is this a good trade for us in trading away Romario Williams? Absolutely, I'm buying that. I think um, Brandon Vasquez, has come on to show that he is your second best option mm -hmm. at striker. Um, Romario Williams was given the chances to succeed and mm -hmm. he never really took them. He played well at the USL level, but I don't mm -hmm. think he ever necessarily showed the ability to be 
a great number two at Atlanta United. I think that he does have technical, he does have ability. Mm -hmm. um, he showed it at Charleston and, mm -hmm. and he, he's proven to be decent, but I don't think it was necessarily working for Atlanta United and you don't mm -hmm. need to keep extra strikers around when you have two who are playing really well. You know what you're gonna mm -hmm. get from Joseph Martinez and Brandon Vasquez has shown mm -hmm. that he's developing and he's working hard and he's younger. So as far as a straight up trade, especially for Justin Miram, I think Justin Miram made it worth it in that last game alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it, it, I think the, the interesting aspect here is though, not having uh, a couple of strikers, at least for this period where it's a little bit barren, just Joseph Martinez is coming back, but you know, any sort of just uh, hopefully not a, you know, a freak injury here and there, you only have one experienced striker, you know, essentially. Right, but I mean, uh, but so uh, it, is, it is something where it's like, you know, maybe should we have at least delayed it a little bit, at least after July 9th, or, you know, it's like, uh, I, don't, I think you have Brandon Vasquez, and he's showing yeah. he offers you something different. And if Joseph and Brandon Vasquez go down, that's not something you account for. And no. it's not like you have a lot of other mm -hmm. cup competitions outside of the U.S. Open Cup, and you're already in the quarterfinal stage mm -hmm. on that. So as far as fixtures go, I think you have the ability to meet that demand. Well, at least in this player, month, it's a, if a, it's player, a lot. And, and then say, Tito Vizalba does come fit. He is does have the mm -hmm. ability to play up top as well. So I think mm -hmm. you do have the cover there. And Atlanta added needed to open roster spots because as far as attack mm -hmm. goes, I think on the whole, they're We're pretty good there. They yeah. need to figure out spots for other players in different positions to get some more depth. So right. I think mm -hmm. for me, I think it makes complete sense. Yeah. And yeah, for me, I agree. It's a, it's a buy for me and that this was a great trade because I think for Justin Miram, who uh, I think for that wing depth, especially he's, you know, come up uh, just, I think, you know, it's, this is uh, a fantastic trade, pretty much, in that sense that uh, w while Ezekiel Barco has been away, while uh, Tio Bijal has been injured, I mean, it's been an immense help being able to rotate guys like he and Dion Pereira out. So, you know, I think this is, a, um, you know, in terms of that, I don't love the timing, but I love that uh, it really didn't cost us very much. A Romario, who's pretty much, I get, you know, I think on a USL level, He's a USL striker. He's your third string striker. You traded for a starter on the wing. Yeah. So yeah, we're a, you know former starter on the wing. Yeah. I don't know if Justin Miram is a well. I mean, he's starter. starting for you right now, and he's he an is. MLS proven quality, which yeah. Mario Williams unfortunately was not. Yeah. So uh, and uh, yeah, so that does it for buy and sell. But also another bit of news is that uh, Atlanta United 2's Josef Samuel has been released or they mutually parted ways uh, as said so in the uh, the press release and so you know um, you know it's he's a guy that I think was seeing less and less playing time at Leonardo 2 it's a shame because uh, I think if you saw in the five strike five um, with Jay Riddle yeah at the podcastathon I mean he just showed what a great guy he was I mean just a uh, a guy that um, you want to see succeed, and it's unfortunate it's not Atlanta United 2, but we wish him the best moving forward, as well as Romario Williams. But uh, that does it for the news, at least for the first team news. Atlanta United 2, uh, they lost 2-1 away to Ludon United. I always read it as London, and I hate it, because <laughs> it looks so close, but it's Ludon, it's yeah. just weird. Yeah, it's like Ludon Wainwright, you know, yeah. like, uh, it's... It is strange, sure. Yeah, but um, yeah, and as mentioned in the athletic, LA United two, yeah, I mean, yeah, they haven't won since uh, April, pretty much. It's yeah, a team or a setup that is not really supposed to be winning every single week. It's the, how much rotation that they have, how many academy guys that are playing on a consistent basis. I mean, it's for development and for minutes. Exactly. Like, if you're expecting anything more than that, I'm sorry. It's just like it's at least this season and last season. It's just not what it is. But um, you know, I think you see future stars. You go to see future stars, and that's kind of what it's for. But anyway, uh, now's the time to plug some of the new stuff that we have coming on the channel, and we hope you can check out Five Strike Five, as mentioned earlier, with Jay Riddle premiered today. Uh, at least the day that we uh, are you know, shooting this. Uh, and pretty much, uh, we'll, we'll just kind of leave it as is of, and not explain too much of what uh, it is, but pretty much we will be uh, talking about uh, Atlanta United things in a very truncated and bite-sized fashion. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. Check it out if you haven't. Also, there is another Squad Goals 
uh, coming up and it's with a current Atlanta United player, so get hyped for that. Uh, yeah, check it out soon, and it is... He beat my ass in FIFA. Yeah, he, they, he, the aggregate score was just ridiculous. It was a I mean, lot to not so much. Yeah, and it, uh, I rooted for the, uh, the guy the entire time because I knew I after felt really confident that, that warm-up game, oh, If ugly. you watched the one that we released this past week with DJE, I felt really good coming out of that because I played some good stuff. Yeah. It's like almost the exact opposite. It, it, it wasn't good. Yeah, but watch this guy and Devin and myself. And uh, me and Devin just, yeah, indeed. it's not good. It'll be a lot of fun, so hopefully you guys check it out in mass. And we also have some giveaways coming along with that, so be sure to check that out. But anyway, guys, let's move on to the mailbag. And you guys send in these questions through IG story. Please continue to do so, and we might answer your question in the future. First question comes from Cooper West 10 Am I wrong to be upset with PT? I truly hate his work ethic. Work ethic. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. I think that uh, like we kind of talked about already. A lot. I'm <laughs> upset with PT. I'm frustrated by his work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, it's just one of those things. He, uh -huh. he he cuts a frustrating figure right now for uh -huh. I think himself. I don't think he. I think he's frustrated as well. I yeah. think he obviously would love to be doing better. Yeah. Um, and because he's mentioned he, he wants to go to Europe and yeah, this is. Uh, not helping his case. Not not exactly helping his case, and you know he definitely needs to pick up his form as soon as possible. And whatever way you can find that, maybe uh, you know talk to a, a therapist, uh, find uh, figure find, something out. Yeah, find uh, you know I don't know, just like Lucky yoga pain. or I something. Know. I don't know, just find that Zen space. I want him to start scoring bangers because I know he can, yeah. and he will make us so much better if he can find form. Yeah, and so uh, next question comes from uh, Nell Oof. Why is everyone so hard on PT? They did this the same with Barco last year. And PT is 25 years old. Barco is 18. Barco is a young man moving away to a foreign country. So is PT, but he was much, much younger and he was expected to have development and to grow and to get better. PT was the reigning South American player of the year, won Copa Libertadores, River Plate. He was kind of one of the finished articles and was already linked to big clubs in Europe. So I don't think it's too hard to have expectations for a player of that level. It's, uh, and like we've mentioned earlier, it's uh, to a degree. And so I think that's where it's, you know, there needs to be still, um, I think, the support for him. The being so hard on him. I'm supporting I mean, him. I just want him to do better. Oh, of course. But yeah, I think it's not you. I think it's some of the, the fans that are definitely just ragging on him all the time and on all the comments everywhere. And it's just like, I mean, I get it. It's just one of those things where, I mean, I think, you know, if we reverse it a little bit and just was, you know, just a little bit more support. If I remember correctly, didn't River Plate fan set his car on fire? Oh, exactly. So anything that he gets in comments in English, which is a language he doesn't sure. know too much about, I don't think will hurt him too much. And the pressure he's facing here is not the same yeah, that he pales faced in River. It for pales sure. in comparison. No but, one's gonna light his car on fire. Yeah, and, but he he came up well. Yeah, ho hopefully not. Yeah, don't but, do that. I'm just okay. saying, do not do that. That yeah. would be a dickhead move. Yeah. Let's, let's not be those people. But uh, anyway, so let, let's just move on. Um, next question comes from a few bands. Which positions would you like to see improve via transfer market? Uh, I mean, we've talked about it. It's, midfield check. Yeah, midfield check is uh, at least that. Um, yeah, I think maybe. Right back. Yeah, some depth for right back, some maybe, I think for left back, this is where it's very, very tough. I think. People want to see, uh, you know, someone that's a starter come in. We just don't have that TAM money to bring someone in, especially when we have, I mean, how many can you count guys that have played left back this season? You know, you have George Bellow, you have Mark, uh, Michael Parkers, you have Florentine Pogba, you have Mikey Ambrose, and you have Breck Shea. You have a lot of options. None are essentially uh, the out-and-out -out starter right now. I think if all were healthy and on form, you have George Bellow probably as the starter. But Florentine Pogba looked shown, really good in this past. He match. absolutely did. But I think against a top winger, I think I want to see that first before I really say, you know, he's the out and out starter. It's just not. I don't he offers it's... something physically that we haven't seen too much oh, for sure. before. Where yeah. whenever teams tried to go long down that side, sure. he won every header, and whenever yeah. he had a physical battle, he won that as well. Not but to if, mention he's not bad on the ball. Yeah. If if there's a guy that's dribbling at him at pace, I want to see that. He played left back in the Europa League for Saint Etienne. A while ago. Two years? <laughs> a two while years. ago. So, you know, two years can make a huge difference on a lot of people. So it's just, you know, a few years or two years, it's 
uh, you know, 28 to 30 or 30 to 32. That's, that's a big difference. He's what, 28? I mean, he's, 28. it's MLS, he'd be all right. Okay, all right. So anyway, uh, next question from some uh, Luke Allen say, how much longer will Bello be out injured? Yeah, I mean, essentially, it's kind of been a, a little bit of a, a longer period now. Uh, I think it was in May where it said it was going to be a little longer because of uh, the surgery. And so I think it was eight to 10 weeks. It's getting to around that period. I think it's August that he's going to be uh, fully at least recovered. And then we'll see how long it takes for him to actually, uh, you know, get back to match fitness. So we'll go from there. Hopefully we can get him back. Cause I'd love to see him with another chance in the first team. Because yeah. if he can start developing and finding that form, he offers a lot. And yeah. he could be your left back for a while. And he has a lot of talent and promise coming with him. It's just mm -hmm. been a frustrating season for him being injured. You know, he's got to be frustrated yeah. with that. So Absolutely. best of luck in his recovery. And hopefully we see him soon. Indeed. And the last question comes from Mr. Chris Pratt. Thank you, Starler, for the question. Uh, if you could design a new kit for us, what would it look like? That's such a good question. Uh, I mean, not this one. Not, not this one, not this one. Yeah, no, 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 no. This, this is a very like, isn't this very 90s to you? Like, this just screams Absolutely, 90s yeah, yeah, to me. Yeah. It, it looks like, I don't know, uh, it looks like one of those, um, I don't know, like trailers, like one of those, Yeah. you know. Um, I feel like this would be great for like, if Top Gun, the movie, had like a five-a-side team. This would be a great jersey. <laughs> Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, and this is the Lots uh, of 80s, yeah, the, the Independence Day kit. Uh, that they're is, is it like a, a new kit each week, pretty much. It um, right like now, it's it. yeah. There's their their MLS <laughs> loves the whole theme of warm up tops because yeah. it allows them to promote. Sure. Um, different things and so obviously we had the pride warm-ups that you saw this yeah. past month and we have this yeah. for the month of July because freedom in America right um, but anyway I think we're stalling if you could design a kit what would it look like uh, I I take a lot of inspiration from a lot of the Milan kits because the colors are the same sure. I love there are a few things that I love about the current kit right now I mm -hmm. love the gold linings the gold that you have on like the sleeve and around the neck yeah I love a kit with a collar some people really hate it I love There's kits that have a lot collars. of people hate it. yeah um, maybe I added, I'm biased obviously I've had some sure. great kits with collars uh -huh. and I always think of Eric Hansen on Cristiano Ronaldo flipping the collar yeah. up and I know that Joseph Martinez would flip his collar up if he had it yeah, and that'd be fantastic think. yeah okay um, I like that um, I, I really love because uh, in terms of stripes but I mean, it's not for this season. For Barcelona, they went with the squares this season for an inexplicable reason. Never but, do that. But uh, I think, yeah, I think it's something along the lines of what Barca have done in the past. Um, I mean, now we've kind of gone fluid with the stripes. So I think, uh, you know, five stripes was a perfect number and it makes sense, of And course. it will always be in the badge. Yeah. The badge will always, always have five stripes. Badge. And, uh, but I think, um, I would love to see something back and front with all five stripes, um, you know, and maybe a little bit more gold in it. Now, the gold lining is just classy. I like exactly. that gold. It gives that bit of, you know, that royalty and we've won things exactly. unlike other teams. And uh, I think ideally you see another star. Yes. Above the badge. Yes, that so. would be good. That, that's the most important design concept is that there's another star there. Exactly. So anyway, that does it for the mailbag. Thank you guys for sending in those questions. And we'll get to the match preview now, which is against the Chicago Fire. It's at SeatGeek Stadium. They've changed it. Again, you and know. they're gonna be changing that stadium soon, it sounds yeah. like, when they move back to the city itself. Yeah, exactly. They'll finally be in Chicago proper. But um, yeah, and you know, uh, they're a team that are in really, really just I would say terrible form right now. Yes. Uh, in their last six, they've lost, drawn, drawn, lost, drawn, and lost. So was Toronto. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, it's one of those trap games pretty much. Uh, you know, you get comfortable going in, and it's like, okay, this might be easy three points. It's not. And you also have that <laughs> big matchup with New York Red Bulls on the weekend. As exactly. Well. So you gotta kind of maybe prep in, uh, you know, in with that in mind, and so, are there guys who you rest a little bit? We'll get into that a little later, but they're a team uh, that in the past that you know we played them, we won four out of five, at least in MLS. We of course, lost against them in the US Open Cup, about one nil loss at the Benz. But um, yeah, you know, in terms of playing them at home, we've been decent, uh, at least at, uh, in Chicago, except for that first season, of course. But, uh, you know, they're also a team that's yeah, they're, they can be very up and down this season. Uh, yeah, I think at least 
when they played us previously at the Benz, they left a lot of space behind, which was fantastic for us. That we, we should have beaten them by more than two goals. Yeah. It, it should have been three or four or even yeah. five. I mean, I, I was frustrated that Atlanta United didn't put more goals past them because uh -huh. Chicago had absolutely no defensive organization or shape in that match. Yeah. And honestly, if they watched film, if anyone, I mean, obviously it's hard to do, mm -hmm. but their keeper was so far off the line that if you get the chance, just pull away and you're going to have a go because he was True. playing almost up by the halfway line at times. It was mad how far that keeper was out off of his line playing like Manuel Neuer like on a bender or something. Yeah, super keeper crazy. stuff. Uh, yeah, not not wise probably, but um, yeah, and also, yeah, so they're a team that, uh, yeah, they, you know, love a counterattack. They, you know, love playing through Bash and Schweinsteiger, of course. Uh, even to a fault when it's just like, fault. what is he doing and why is he doing this right now? Exactly. Uh, and that's the thing, they have some talented players on their team. I think it's just, on a whole, when you have a Bash and Schweinsteiger as a center back, it's just, what, what are you doing? There's not a lot of pace there. Yeah, exactly. And so, especially if you play a high line, which they're doing, it's like, okay, yeah, please. Playing with fire. Continue, Continue to, to do, do it. this. Yes. yes. But, uh, and so, um, you know, but, you know, through that, they are a team that can create a lot of those scoring chances um, and, you know, a lot of long shot opportunities. So, you know, kind of a little bit of an Achilles heel, especially if they're playing at home, they're probably going to want to at least uh, perform for their... You know, 17 fans. 17 fans. I, I think one of the curious things about this match, that, and, and how you said how it uh, lends to being a trap game, is the fact that Atlanta United has lost their last three away games. And despite not being in good form, Chicago is unbeaten in their last seven home games. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of a, a rock and a hard place type thing right here where one of these has to give way because I don't think this match particularly lines up as a draw because I think both teams have flaws and I think both teams are going to go for goals. Mm -hmm. So there, there's some very interesting things there and the fact that Chicago isn't very good at keeping goals out of the back of the net right now and Atlanta had scored at least two goals in their last two matches. So I think there there is some joy that Atlanta United can find and knowing that they'll set up in a similar way if not more aggressive than how you than, than they played you a month ago. Yeah. I think it sets up potentially even though it is a trap game for Atlanta United getting some players back like a Joseph Martinez and having the confidence of having mm -hmm. just taken a victory against Montreal, I think Atlanta could definitely find themselves with some opportunities to get three points here. Yeah, but in terms of the guys to watch, their danger men, Alexander Katai, their attacking midfielder, he has four goals and four assists in 16 appearances this season. Just a really good guy on the ball, will shoot from distance, so we have to keep an eye out for him, midfielders. Mark these guys. Yeah. Uh, Nico Gaitan, of course, just coming into MLS. He's a quality player. He hasn't put up the numbers necessarily yet. He only has two goals and four assists in 14 mm -hmm. appearances, three of those being substitute appearances. But mm -hmm. he's a player that played at a very high level in Europe, moved to China, played well there. Mm -hmm. he, he, he He's a good player. He's a quality yeah. player. I mean, he was linked to Man United for what felt like 15 years. Oh, for sure. But he's a good player that you have to watch out for. And yeah. I think with their midfielders, they all have the ability to kind of pop in and out across any of the positions in their in their attacking midfield. So that'll offer some challenges for Atlanta United. Yeah, and especially on a set piece, he's a guy that we need to keep an eye out for. And yeah, hopefully we just don't concede very many uh, fouls in or around the box that, uh, or just definitely not in the box, but around the box that would be uh, susceptible to his territory. But also, Nemanja Nikolic, uh, their striker, He's got six goals and 14 appearances this season, so not a bad return for their striker so far, but uh, he's a guy that uh, has won the Golden Boot in the past. He's a guy that knows his way around the uh, the box and you know finding the back of the net, and so, yeah, we gotta be able to uh, mark him to death. I think uh, that'll be fine, I think, though, with Miles Robinson and LGP. I, I worry less about Nikolic, and I worry more about these attacking midfielders. Yeah, Katai um, and, and, and Gaitan. Gaitan. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, what we have to do in terms of our keys to this match, what do you think? I think you got to exploit Chicago's poor defensive positioning and their lack of shape, really. They're going to come at you because they're playing at home. They did the same thing in the bins, and it didn't work out for them. And I think that Atlanta United can just look at that film, look at some of the places that they could have really exploited Chicago even more, and try to pinpoint those. Um, I think it's really interesting to see who starts striker in this match. Joseph Martinez, like we spoke on, hasn't played a lot 
for Venezuela at the Copa America. So I think in terms of fitness, in terms of his hunger, and you know how much he loves to score goals, he's going to want to start. So you have kind of a situation on your hands of, are you ready to put him right back in coming back from international duty? Do you feel that he's fit enough? Do you feel that the travel's taken anything out of him? If so, do you sort of Brandon Vasquez, who I think also, despite not having maybe the pace of Joseph Martinez, his physicality, I think, could be very useful against a Chicago team that might not be able to deal with him. Mm -hmm. And I think- Although with them being kind of slower in the back, I think that just kind of lends to- Well, he's quick though. That's the thing is that he Brandon is Vasquez is quick, quick and he's quick, shown his ability to be physical and turn on people. So mm -hmm. if he can do that, well, well, that assist against Toronto, mm -hmm. well, the assist, he didn't get the credit yeah. for the assist, but mm -hmm. the movie put in Toronto mm -hmm. for that second goal, I think is a good example of that. Yeah. And I think finally is, not shipping an early goal. Yeah. Because if you ship an early goal, again, you're starting off you know, already behind and mm -hmm. digging yourself a hole. If Atlanta United can avoid shipping that early goal away from home like they've been doing over and over again this season, then I think they'll find themselves with possession to be able to break the Chicago team down and exploit the issues that we've spoke on earlier that they have in defense. Right, so uh, in let's get into the uh, injuries and unavailable players for Chicago. We have Johan Capello is a uh, doubt with a thigh injury. And Jordi Mihaljevic and uh, Francisco Calvo are both away on international duty at the Gold Cup. So, you know, another shortened side for us to contend with. But, uh, you know, that kind of is uh, good and bad. You have the aspect of you're not really familiar with the guys that may be brought into the, the first uh, into the 11 uh, for Chicago, and that might be difficult for us to really plan for that. Uh, that is what's uh, kind of, I think, what was our undoing against Toronto FC for sure. Uh, but, you know, it's it's one of those things where these guys uh, maybe aren't as, you know, big of a factor in terms of the guys that you really need to watch out for maybe. So, um, but for Atlanta, yes, uh, Tito is still out. Uh, as Echo Barco, like we mentioned earlier in the episode, uh, will be kind of held out, at least for this match. And Kevin Kratz still, uh, he pretty much had to restart his rehab. And George Bellow, of course, is out. So uh, that gets us to our predicted 11. Abs and, absolutely. Yeah, let's get through the lines together. And uh, yeah. Bradley's you know. in net, let's yeah, be honest. For that's sure. pretty straightforward. I Indeed. think Francisco, es Francisco, Franco Escobar. Franco Escobar, I'm sure. Calvo. Yeah, sure. Uh, Escobar. Yeah, needs to be at right back. Um, yeah. I think, you know, he needs Not to... Not to get a yellow card. Yeah, he needs to really quell those because it's, yeah. First game back, Yellow first, card. Right, yeah, gets a yellow card. It's just like, yo. Uh, but, uh, I Robinson think... Robinson LGP. Yeah, that's obvious there. Now, in terms of left back, that's where it's interesting, I, I think, here because... Uh, he's been kind of, I think, right to board. He's been uh, bouncing it, you know, one player here, one player there, one one player uh, this game, one player this game. So who do you have? I have Breck Shea. I think that the rotation between him and Pog is going to be something we see throughout July mm -hmm. because I don't think either one of them are fit enough or necessarily good enough to where you want to play them in back-to-back -back games with short rest. So I think because Pogba started last game, mm -hmm. I think you'll see Breck Shea start this game and then Pogba possibly come in for him as a substitute later in the match. And then mm -hmm. I think you'll that sets up Pogba to start for Red Bull. So I think that it mm -hmm. gives them both that rotation and you're getting both those players in. Yeah. They each kind of offer something similar, but I think Pogba's a bit more physical, but I think yeah. Breck Shea with a week's rest, I think he'll come in and, and he got an assist last time out as well. Don't forget yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. And so uh, I think for me, though, I think Pogba persists at left back. Uh, I think, you know, it's going to happen where, yeah, there is going to be a sub. And so, uh, you know, you start him, you be a little bit more resolute defensively, hopefully. And then you, uh, you know, bring on a guy if you're uh, chasing the game or if you're already up, you know, trying to get another goal. Doesn't really happen with Frank DeBoer, but I think, you know, he's been bringing on Brescia anyway. Uh, and maybe uh, Mikey Ambrose, you know, gets to see some time as well. So I think, uh, you know, between all three of them, there is going to be some playing time, I think, in this match anyway. Now, getting to the midfield, this is where I think we differ a lot, so. Absolutely, for me, I, I, I think he might do a little bit of a change of shape right here. Um, I have him playing with the midfield three with Rometty, Lorenowitz, and Nagby in that midfield three. I think it offers you a bit more control away from home in the midfield, and I think that the fact that the attacking midfielders for Chicago are so good, I think that if you only have two players sitting in that midfield, you put, potentially could find yourself exploited like you saw against Toronto. Mm -hmm. I think Jeff Lernowitz offers you that stability in the midfield that whoever's popping into those spaces behind Rometty and Nagby, who will be relied upon to go forward and start the attacks, mm -hmm. I think it allows you to be a bit more solid at the back because you know you have another player there that can help you sweep up and, and, and 
you know, stop attacks before they start. And yeah. it also, again, it frees up Remedy and Nagby to cover more ground and to become more involved in other parts of the game and in other parts of the pitch, especially when you know that Chicago, when the ball gets forward, they might not always get back. So yeah. it allows them to break further forward quicker and maybe get at them on the counter. Okay, yeah. I think for me, uh, I think it's Remedy and Nagby in midfield. Uh, I, although, um, and this may be, I'm just gonna, I have to reveal uh, who I have up top because I think he tracks back a lot to be able to help out, I think, a little bit. And that's Joseph Martinez. Uh, to where, and who I have in the middle is PT. And so, you know, I think when you've seen them kind of play together, Joseph Martinez drops back a little bit more when, you know, we don't have the ball a little bit. And so, you know, maybe PT can kind of, he doesn't really press a whole lot, but he can do the, the pseudo pressing that he does at least there. And that helps, I think, uh, quell that midfield. And then because I have Gressel on the right, who can uh, at least help out a little bit more, definitely with Franco Escobar there, it, uh, it lessens the need. Um, you can pack that midfield a little bit with Julian Gressel. Um, and then for me, it's uh, Justin Miram, of course. You don't sit a guy who just scored a couple goals uh, on the left, so. Absolutely. Yeah. But for you? me, my, I have a front three. I have Gressel on the right because of his work rate. He can also get back and contribute defensively, whether you want to move him and slide him a bit more to the midfield yeah. or almost, in a sense, play a bit of a 4 4 2, which sounds yeah. kind of crazy. Or even a 4 5 1 if Miriam's dropping back and you really mm -hmm. want to pack that midfield and sit a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. I have Joseph Martinez up top, and then I have Justin Miriam again on the left. Mm -hmm. I think for me, I having looked at that first match against Chicago, I want. I want Joseph Martinez sitting on the shoulder wherever their last defender is because mm -hmm. as you saw in the second goal, it's there. The space will mm -hmm. be there. Play a long ball forward into space for him. Let him turn on someone or let him just run off the shoulder of that mm -hmm. defender and Joseph Martinez will find himself in space and one-on-one -on -one with the keeper. Yeah. And in terms of players one-on-one -on -one with the keeper, you struggle to find anyone in MLS as confident as Joseph Martinez is. And I think that's the best way for him to be used this game. I don't want him yeah. tracking back because I want him sitting on that mm -hmm. shoulder, being that out ball, being that player that Chicago has to constantly worry about. And they've already shown once this season that they can make that mistake. And I think, again, it offers you the flexibility of if you are being overrun, if you're not playing well, then you can have Gressel and you can have Miram drop back into that midfield, it's still a little bit deeper, and you almost have you have five across the midfield. Mm -hmm. And it still allows you, Joseph Martinez, mm -hmm. to be that striker up top and to find that space. So I think it offers enough flexibility mm -hmm. to where Atlanta United can be a lot more solid. And I also don't think that you start a player that you pulled off in the 65th minute or 68th minute that you were very frustrated with away from home where you feel like you need a result against mm -hmm. the team. Now, I think that he sure. could come on, mm -hmm. but I don't think he plays in this match personally. Yeah, no, start I, in this match. yeah sure. I mean, uh, I think for me, why I start him is because I think you're going to kind of probably sum him off earlier anyway in preparation for the Red Bulls, I think. Um, and with that, it's also this. You need some creativity. And in terms of that, uh, Deion Pereira hasn't shown enough yet either to, I think, warrant a, uh, an inclusion. I don't think... Uh, Gressel actually has been playing all that well. And so, you know, you kind of lack a little bit of creativity in some of that combo play if you take out a lot of our creativity. That's fair, so, but I just think with this match, I don't necessarily think you have to worry about being overly creative. I think Chicago mm -hmm. has shown their hand in how they play. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes you just have to realize that if your opponent's gonna allow you to play direct. I just don't think they're gonna do them. that. I, for the it'd second be going against, row, It'd be going against their the way that they play, especially sure. at home, to think that at home they're gonna sit deep mm -hmm. and, and, and not try to play forward. They, they had so little mm -hmm. defensive organization in that mm -hmm. match. That it's hard for me to believe that in this month period where they're still mm -hmm. missing players when they haven't won games, mm -hmm. that they're gonna all of a sudden realize, oh, at home, we need to sit back and counter and play compact against Atlanta United. Mm -hmm. When, if they come to the bins and they try to attack you, that makes sense to think to me that they're gonna to try to attack us at yeah. away from home. And if anything, you can bring PT on and play him on the right as well and then give him that ability to cut in. I think he can still succeed in a 4-3-3 as mm -hmm. well. So I think you can bring it on, but again, I, I think yeah. that the direct play will be open for Atlanta United in this match because I just don't think Chicago are good enough defensively. Yeah, sure, okay. But uh, guys, that gets us to our score prediction and to our next new segment in which uh, we're going to keep tally of our score predictions and at the end of the month, we will play a little game, uh, essentially, where if uh, whomever has the better, I guess, record, per se, or whoever's closest to what actually happened, uh, will do a little consequence, a little dare, if you will. And so, uh, we'll find out what is going to happen later on this month, but 
that gets us to your prediction. So for me, I have Atlanta United winning 3-1. Um, I think for some reason we will ship a goal because we're away from home, so of course we will. But I just, I don't think Chicago are good enough. And I think Joseph Martinez is gonna start. I think he's gonna come back hungry. I don't know if we'll get a hat trick, but he could have had one last match. And I think Atlanta United can just be direct, can take the opportunities as they come. And as the game goes on, I think they're good enough to control the play, settle it in and get three points on the road against a poor Chicago side. Okay. Uh, I think for me, uh, because just the amount of goals that have uh, actually been occurring recently at SeatGeek, uh, I think it's a 2-1 win for Atlanta United. I think we can pull it out. It's just one of those things where, uh, you know, Joseph Martinez is just coming back. Uh, Brandon Vasquez is still acclimating himself to MLS. Um, you know, in terms of if he comes on later, I don't know if he can get a goal. It might be a little bit difficult, but uh, I think, you know, maybe a Julian Gressel will uh, find that opportune space again, uh, find the back of the net. But hopefully that is the case. That's W's and three points for us on the road. Uh, on both of those predictions, we'll find out later in the month uh, how close we actually were. But both of us might be completely wrong. Who knows? Yes, exactly. Uh, but hopefully not. Hopefully, ideally, hopefully we ideally points. we get the three points. That's yeah. the most important thing. But guys, that gets us to the question of the day. And the question of the day, been a lot of talk about PT Martinez today. So I'm gonna put it to you guys. If everyone is fit, Tito, Barco, the whole nine yards, if everyone is fit, should PT Martinez start for Atlanta United right now? Get down in the comments below and let us know what you guys have to say. But guys, that's it for us today. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Share this video because it really helps us, helps us a lot. And smash that like button. And for Tanner McLeod, I'm AJ. Thank you guys so much for watching.